very end, there's a little water vapor bubble, but there's no air in this tube. It's been evacuated, you can see, because of the pinch. And what's fun about it is you can slam the water down. And because there's no air, it doesn't shred the water like uh, raindrops. And so it lands in a big piece like a belly flop. Supposedly, you can break them. So when you give it to somebody, <laughs> don't give it to a strong person. Give it to somebody who's gentle. Another important effect is the noise that collapsing cavitation bubbles produce. A partial vacuum has been pulled in this space above the water column. As I accelerate the tube downwards, the inertial forces produce a pressure gradient in which the pressure decreases as you go down from the free surface. At some level, the pressure is low enough for the liquid to cavitate. The noise is a result of shock waves generated upon bubble collapse. The water hammer effect. When those bubbles burst, they burst with immense force against the object. As the speed of water increases further, the bubbles collapse with ever greater intensity. The process, slowed down nearly a hundred times, reveals a long twisting thread emerging from the metal object. It is in this high speed vortex of bubbles where the secret to the flood's incredible power lies. So if you, if you look at this, the first thing we see here is this very strong uh, vortex here. So you got like a sledgehammer effect. Every time one of these forms and collapses, bang, you got a sledgehammer. Pictures are taken with a high-speed camera with 1,000 frames per second. We focus on that forces that are generated when water is punching on the valve. Water hammer effect is activated by fast closing of a valve. Forces during water hammer effect. In proper speed these effects are not visible to the naked eye. Pictures of the high-speed camera show how a steam vacuum is generated, how the water column is pulled back and punching on the valve. Consequences of water hammer effect. In slow motion you see how water spray squirts out of the flange gasket area. The studs are stretched and at the same time the whole construction is spoiled with a deflection of 15 millimeters. The forces. Vacuum is generated and pulls the water column back with a vacuum pressure of 0.1 to 0.2 bar. The measured distance for the backflow is 30 centimeters. 
Water covers this distance within 64 frames, that means in 64 milliseconds. Thirty centimeters comply 4.7 meters per second or 17 kilometers per hour. This is comparable to the speed of a cyclist. Now steam bubbles are decomposed and deceleration begins. For comparison, a pursuit plane reaches 10 g at most. In an accident deceleration is 50 g at most. Within 8 milliseconds the speed of the water is dropping to zero. In this time you cannot see any vacuum bubbles. That corresponds to an acceleration of 586 meters per square seconds or 59.7 g. During the deceleration there is a force of 29,300 newton on a surface of 50 square centimeters. This is a pressure of 58.6 bar. Differential shock, like thermal shock, occurs in biphase systems. Differential shock can occur whenever steam and condensate flow in the same line, but at different velocities, such as in high pressure condensate return lines. In biphase systems, the velocity of the steam is often 10 times the velocity of the liquid. If this gas flow causes condensate waves to rise and fill the pipe, a seal is formed with the pressure of the steam behind it. Since the steam cannot flow through the condensate seal, pressure drops on the downstream side. The condensate seal now becomes a piston that is accelerated downstream by virtue of this pressure differential. As it is driven downstream, the piston picks up more liquid that is added to the existing mass of the slug and velocity increases. This is differential shock. It occurs in the type of bubble chamber used for studies of high energy nuclear particles. In this photograph, a positron electron pair has produced a track of bubbles in liquid hydrogen, which is at a pressure below the boiling point and is therefore unstable. We have seen that cavitation can take several forms. Small transient bubbles, large, more or less steady cavities, non-stationary cavities, and often a mixture of these types. Let's turn now to an examination of some of the effects associated with cavitation and cavitating flows. What happens to a machine when it begins to cavitate, and how does performance vary with increasing extent of cavitation? Since hydrofoil sections make up so many different types of machines, pumps, turbines, propellers, propeller shaft struts, mixers, we can illustrate what happens to all such machines by studying the forces on the hydrofoil section itself. We have suspended the first hydrofoil model from force gauges, which show us lift and drag on these scales. The flow speed is constant, and the gauges register the corresponding lift and drag. The ambient pressure is set at a level well above that at which cavitation can occur. We are going to induce cavitation by decreasing the ambient pressure in the test section, keeping the speed constant. At first, there is no appreciable change in either force. As cavitation develops, lift decreases and drag rises. You can see from the force balances that the flow is quite unsteady. When we lower the pressure further and allow cavitation to spread, the lift decreases further and the drag continues to rise. We can get an idea of what has happened by examining the pressure distribution on a hydrofoil section.